Welcome back to We Do the Heavy Lifting. I'm your host, Dr. Jenny Yentis, and today we do Caring for Athletes. This is part two of a two-part series in which we're talking with an athletic trainer and a physical therapist about what their jobs are like, how do we get their jobs, what's that day-to-day look like. So let me reintroduce our guests. And again, if you haven't listened to part one, link is in the show notes. And our guests today are Dr. David Reagan Suarez from Rice University, where he serves as the head physical therapist of all sports. And then we have Mr. Saul Luna, who is an athletic trainer here at Texas A&M University and has been doing this job for several years. And um, again, if you haven't listened to part one, we learn a lot about both of them and there's some really interesting tidbits in there and some advice. So really encourage you to go back and listen to that one before you dive into this one. So my first question is going to be a really about the care of the athlete. So you both care for a physical injuries most of the time. Mental injuries come in. We'll talk a little bit about mental blocks that come with physical injuries. But what does that look like? What are the steps from an injury to the athlete training going out on the field? And then, Saul, can you take us to the point where you lead them up to a physical therapist? What's that look like? What is that process for an athlete? They're injured in play. Okay, so at that point in time, I need to get out there. I need to figure out. So, and and these are all the different things that are going through something because all you see is the person going out on the field and doing whatever, but their mind's racing, right? So I got to triage. I got to figure out what's going on. The first thing I need to determine is: Do I need to punt? Do I need to call EMS? Do I need to go directly to a physician? What's going on? So I have to determine what I think is happening, and what the severity is. So ultimately, the end goal is not to have to send them to PT, right? Yes. But, you know, um, once I figure out, and typically what's going to go to PT is something that's really chronic, that's mm-hmm. not just not getting better. It's not responding to conventional, c- conventional treatments, right? And that's why, you know, I'm a big cultural reference guy, right? So one of my favorite lines is like, a man has to know his limitations, right? So you have to, you can't let your pride guide you into a bad decision. You got to know when to ask for help. Right, so if I typically give somebody four to six visits, four to six sessions. Now that could happen over a course of a week. It could, you know, it just depends on the person, mm-hmm. right? And so if I'm not making satisfactory process, then that's when I got to send them to the team physician. Team physician will confirm my, my suspicion and then um, we'll make the referral to PT. So then I go ahead and we, and we like to accompany our student athletes to their PT session. That way we can find out what we need to be, do, be doing to support the recovery process while they're going to PT. Okay. So when they end up on your training table, what's that looking like? Yeah, a lot of times there's, it's, it's either gonna be one of two things, the chronicity of an injury like Saul said, or, or someone who's ended up with a surgical um, opportunity. So mm-hmm. if there, we here see a lot of the long-term surgical cases, um, ex- And also at Rice, we'll see those as well. And so um, we're taking them from day zero of surgery until they complete all the criteria of objective testing in the return to sport for whatever injury that might be and whatever the best evidence is at the time and other things. And then we're collaborating amongst the team um, with that. So maybe they're not doing seeing the whole team at day zero. Maybe they're Mm -hmm. only seeing me, the dietitians, and then – uh, performance psychology and then from there we're going to integrate strength and conditioning we're going to integrate the athletic trainings on, uh, for recovery on the day off and any, any soft tissue needs and then we continue to build that out until we're bringing in sports science to help us with some of our objective testing and criteria to eventually get them back to practice and then eventually get them back into competition so my question is do the two of you make return to play decisions then or how is that done I would not like to make a return to play decision without the athletic training be, being there. And it's a <coughs> collaborative effort at this, mm-hmm. at this level. And so um, it, there's going to be multiple people putting their hand up or down saying yes or no. And, and, and it's, you're, you're not on an island, but you have to be good at what you can, can provide the team. Yeah, because, you know, so with regard to the whole rehabilitative process, he's the expert. So I want his, his input on what's appropriate, what's inappropriate. And then I have to figure out how to condition the athlete, right? Because the whole point, the whole point of this is to get them back on the field. So 
there has to be some sort of continuity with regard to their training. And so, you know, I talk to the doctor, doctor gives me, he establishes the, the boundaries, mm -hmm. and then I, it's my job to operate within the boundary, boundaries. And that's where you talked about earlier, the coaching aspect, right? So now I go to coach and say, hey coach, these, these are the, this is what we got to work with here. And then we put our heads together and figure out what we're gonna do. Then I run it by him, make sure it's okay, make sure everything's good, not missing anything, and then we, we execute. Okay. Yeah. I think I think the, the the beauty in that is that there's some things like I said in the first podcast. There's some things I've learned from track and field that I've integrated with other sports and mm -hmm. and vice versa. And there's things that I see Saul doing with a certain athlete, getting them back onto track. I'm like, wow, that's that's amazing. And for me, I get to learn and network amongst. And so he's had 25 or sorry, however many years in in this several years, I guess, in this in this sport. And so, you know, a wealth of knowledge there and being able to see what he's doing with the athletes there and helps mm -hmm. me be able to say, oh, this guy doesn't look like that for this other sport. Maybe we got to change some things up. So it's a collaborative effort. So with that being said, so you're seeing you have a collaborative effort. And typically when you see an athlete, you're seeing them one on one. And it's more than just physical rehab at that point in time, because there's there can be a mental block or mental I don't know the right term. You'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. Just like a, a fear maybe that comes with post injury or post surgery of getting re injured or something like that. Is a lot of your jobs then on the other side of it dealing with the not the psychology side, because there are sports psychologists that do that, but how do you integrate that? What does that look like for you on your end? You hit the nail on that's exa the way you, that's exactly what the athletes like. Oh, all you know is that they're scared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the, you know, so whenever, you know, in, in my role, my job is to establish, create a relationship with the student athlete, right? And so within that relationship, there has to be trust that's established. And so one of the best ways to help somebody, and, and when they come to us, they've been hurt before. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they've got those scars and they've, they've, got, they've got that baggage. So now I have, to, I have to replace that with positive experiences. So then that's why we, we communicate about what he's seeing, what he thinks, because we wanna set the athlete up for small victories. So every small vic victory is a cumulative. Every small mm -hmm. victory that you get just keeps building and building and building, and you keep gently nudging and encouraging, you know, and maybe we'd need to back off today, right? Because if the athlete's mind isn't there, then, then it's just not gonna work out, right? Yeah. But, so it, it's, it's really wild, because, you know, uh, being in it for several years, you kind of learn when to push and when not to push, when to back off. But it all comes down to that relationship. You got to have it with your student athlete. And if you don't have it, then you have to earn it. And how do you earn it? By setting them up for success. Small wins, small wins, small wins. That's, that's the takeaway. Okay. Uh, I honestly couldn't agree more. I think it's just all about the relationship that you have with the student athlete and, and knowing you know, when to either push, pull, or, or just stay. Um, and I think for me trying, sometimes you, you think that they're ready and then they, they tell you they're not ready and, and listening to them and, and kind of just being that person. I try to get to know them as a student athlete mm -hmm. and as a person as well. And I think, you know, breaking some of those barriers down is what is going to help them at the end of the day to be forthcoming and say, I'm not ready for this. And you say, all right, I, I know you're not. And so I think, so couldn't have said it any better. Do you each, uh, I, won't, I asked you to kind of think about it before we even started recording, but is there an example that you could give of something that's been really rewarding in treating an individual or an injury, some case that's been, it's really a doozy or something, uh, you know, that our listeners can kind of sort of start to pick to, picture what that looks like, what care looks like for those athletes? Well, so for me, um, I would argue that the biggest, so one of the, you know, so one of the biggest challenges that I have is like we talked in the previous podcast, I wear so many hats, mm -hmm. right? So the one hat that I try to convince our student athletes that I wear is I, I am a performance enhancer. I can help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And so how do we do that? Well, when we talked, when I gave my uh, dry needling talk, we talked about trigger points and we talked about how an active trigger point already hurts. It's already referring pain. You know it's there, right? 
And that's not a problem. Like it is a problem, but it's that's not what I'm worried about. What I'm worried about are what are called latent trigger points, which mm -hmm. which lie there in silence. They're almost like landmines, right? And you don't know what happens until it until it becomes active and blows up. And so by searching these out in our student athletes, we can help to not only decrease pain, but we can also help a muscle to fire better. So now they're able to perform better. So I had a student athlete the week before the conference championship, right? Coach calls me, he can't finish practice. His groin hurts. Mm -hmm. So in your mind, we're toast, we're done. Like it's a week before, because in my previous experience, I had been taught that that was a groin strain, right? Mm -hmm. Thankfully, I have great mentors, right? And so one of my mentors, Dr. Mars Capatici, you know, he, he, he's the one that brought me into this dry needling world, and so, but using his mentorship, I palpated his adductor and it wasn't sore. So then I kept palpating and I found out it was the pectineus. So the mm -hmm. pectineus was super tight, had a super tight band, stuck some needles in there. I mean, I wish I could tell you it was like, oh my gosh, I'm fixed. It wasn't like that. He was a little bit better. And so we nursed him for a week. We went to the conference meet and I, I didn't know what was going to happen. He was doing okay. He, he practiced very little. He won the gold medal in the decathlon, mm. and he set the collegiate record. Wow. All right, so that right there shows, you know, and so what went into that? Soft tissue assessment, mm -hmm. selecting the appropriate modality from the toolbox to treat him, which, and, and obviously there had to be a lot of trust there. The relationship was there. The student athlete trusted me, he trusted his body. He went out there and he was the, the like that was wild to think that he was on the table a week prior, yeah, and now he's the collegiate record holder. That's impressive. <laughs> it shows good care, yeah, thoughtful care, yeah. Regan, what about you? Yeah, I think for for me, it, it's the um, just seeing the resiliency and just like the fortitude that people have to go through a rehab process, especially after surgery. You know, sometimes things are taken from them and, and or they, they feel that way. And just to see that the maturity that they've grown over time, most of these athletes are anywhere between 18 and 22 to 23 years old. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're growing every day. And like I tell them early on, like, this is going to be hard. This is tough. And sometimes some of them have been through it. And sometimes some of them have been through it and are having a harder time a second go round. And, and just that mental like resiliency and fortitude that they, they get. And then, on the other end, when they're back to competition and they're back competing, they sit there and saying, I'm doing great. I'm doing better than I was before. I'm able to, they, they are able to adapt and learn more from an athlete's perspective, but their bodies are also more prepared to, to go out there mm -hmm. and to compete. So hearing them, you know, they, they'll contact me or, or we'll ta talk and they'll say, you know, like, I'm better for the team. I'm doing, mm -hmm. I'm do I might not be winning an SEC championship, but I'm PRing. And that's what is it's meaningful because they're they're in the right headspace and they're right they're saying like I'm this is what I'm here for like and their journey is all goes back to that like I said in the first podcast I started this because I had surgery they might go not go into this field but they'll be able to be better people and better more better people like within a team or a community for that reason so yeah absolutely I can only imagine what adversity is probably not the right word but it is i mean sure. it's it's a challenge in life and when you're that age sometimes it does feel like it's career ending it does feel like it's you know and it may not be uh but it's overwhelming because you don't have the experience yet to know i can come back from this and i can be even better or maybe i'm not coming back from this but now it's given me yeah. this experience that i can now take into something else and help others or do whatever I like to t have like a little saying. I'll tell them sometimes when they're when they're when it's not a good day. I was like, "How many times have you kicked a ball into the net, or how many times have you hit a baseball?" And they're like, thousands. And I'm like, "Well, what's going to happen if you if you think you go out there and you're going to miss it?" They're like, "I'm going to miss it." And I'm like, "Well, you can't think that this is a bad day. If you think that this is a bad day or this is putting you back or taking it away from you, we're going to just be spinning in the mud here. Like, we need to kind of keep driving forward and just reset. Let's like just take a second and reset and and it kind of just relates to like, oh, I've done, I've had, I've been hurt before, you know, like this has been mm -hmm. a new thing. So what can we build on from there? And that's some ways to try to help get that across. But absolutely. It does sound like for both of you, a lot of your job is not just people shouldn't think of it as just a physical 
rehabilitation. It is a whole person. It's holistic. You're really, you're probably the point of care that they're seeing more often than maybe at some point at their, than their coach. True. Yeah. Well, I've really enjoyed having both of you on. And I want to ask if there's anything you want to leave our listeners with. We always let people end with any type of tidbit or last little bit that they want to throw out there. Is there any last little thing that you want to leave our listeners with? So just remember that, you know, we all have the goal. We all have the big goal. But just remember that sometimes it's not a straight line from where you are mm-hmm. to the, where the goal is going to be, right? There, Absolutely. There's going to be many twists and turns. But if you know where you want to end up, right, and you keep that, you know, at, at the forefront of your brain and you keep working, sometimes, you know, so like, for example, me, somebody, oh, I want to be a collegiate athletic trainer like you. Well, guess what? That wasn't the plan. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. I didn't, that was, this, this was not where I planned to end up. I, I was a high school athletic trainer. And I worked at three different high schools before I ended up at Texas A&M. Mm-hmm. But once again, and like I mentioned, you know, in, in the last podcast, like all I focused on was was being the best me that I could be and working hard and taking care of people and, and adding value. Like I want to add value to people's lives. And that's really what drives me. And so that's all I was worried about. And then next thing I know, I'm at Texas A&M. So just remember that. Have the big goal, but it's okay to take a few detours here and there on your way to getting to the big goal. Yeah. And sometimes those detours will take you to a new end goal, yeah. which you didn't even know existed. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yes. then, and then it, it's even, it's just as exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. Reagan? Yeah, I would say like knowing what maybe a, a general two-year, five-year, and ten-year plan is. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That's a question that you'll probably get asked for, especially for the young listeners out there. I've been asked that a lot in my career already. Is what's your two-year, five-year, and ten-year plan? And I tell people, I don't really know. I, I, it's not a straight line, but I know I want these pillars, and I want to be on this team or, or or have these people around me. And then I would also say, say the do things for the heart of it, like. It, it's hard and that's good and you have to have some of that in your career to get to that five to ten year plan if everything's easy and you haven't been challenged you're probably not going to get to where you are because other people have been challenged in various different ways so do things for for the heart of it and and just keep always just having confidence that you'll keep keep building and building yeah i'm glad you said that because like i don't i'm sorry i don't have a 10-year plan my, my plan is to be the best i can be yep. and when i wake up tomorrow i want to be a little bit better and then when i wake up if I get to wake up the next day, I want to be a little bit better, and then we'll, we'll see where we end up. Yeah. I wish more people lived by that philosophy that both of you have. It would be a lot different sometimes, and we'd have a lot of people. Everybody just keeps striving to just be a little better every day. Well, I thank you both so much for joining us for two episodes and taking time out of your day to share that, as well as going to HD 13 and giving your talks at our Hilliard discussion. That's really important to us, and we're really thankful that you took. That was a full day that you talk about behind the scenes. <laughs> they, they had a lot of work they had to do for that day to prepare for that little 15, 12-minute talk, so thank you. And to our listeners, as always, if you have any comments or topics that you would really like to hear about, please feel free to email us at huffines at tamu.edu. And we hope to see you next time and stay safe, stay healthy, and stay active. Thank you. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha.